What's so funny, as I learn more about the advertising world, the whole notion of the imagery and the copy, these are all things that were important on television. At some level, the copy was mainly important on radio since it wasn't a visual medium. There's really no difference. I'm not saying anything new that hasn't been talked about by pioneers in advertising long before me. Here are the two big variables. One, we live through massive fragmentation. No longer does it, do we sit, I mean, think about the notion of storytelling as an advertiser in 1975. The person sat home on their ass in a couch, watched their television. They did not have a remote control. Right, I mean like, the, you know, Happy Days did its thing, it went into a commercial, and you actually consumed it. I mean, what I talk about is not distribution or how many impressions, I talk about attention. Did you actually pay attention? And so this notion, when I debate television, everyone's like, no, 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 it's not everybody DVRs or fast forwards. I'm like, fine, but I don't believe it. <laughs> Number two, if you're lucky enough to even get your commercial to break through, Every, I mean, the, the, a stunning amount of people here, the moment something goes to a commercial, they're grabbing for their phone, and their phone gets their attention, whether they wanna say something on Twitter about what they just saw, or if they're just busy and wanna look up their latest email. I mean, nobody has time anymore. We have screens pulling at us from different directions, and the screen that is winning right now, not forever, I don't know if Google Glass wins, I don't know if we're all shooting up to Mars, helmets, I don't care. What I care is right now, people are addicted. How many people here in every 24 hour window, including while you're sleeping, are always within arm's reach of their telephone? Raise it. And that's it, right? Like, and to me, (laughs) and to me, if we don't start respecting, you all right, Ken? I'm wondering if we see a show of hands or how many people are always within arm's reach of the New York Observer. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and, and then you get into this next question, Ken, as I'm having fun with myself here. How many people here, when they watch television outside of live sports and live award shows, are watching it on their time? How many people here DVR on demand or HBO on the go when they watch television? Raise your hand. Illegal downloads. You, how, many, how many people watch television on their time, not when it actually airs? Raise your hand. And so of all of you, how many of you fast forward every single commercial? And you start getting into this game and you start getting into the game of banner ad click-throughs have collapsed, open rates on email services have collapsed, marketers ruin everything, we're proud to do it. And now we've got social networks. And listen, everything I write about in this book over the next five to 10 years will also be ruined. Everybody will figure out these methods. That's why I'm getting ahead of it. I want to be part of it. And they'll understand it. And we're, we're going to start seeing more and more storytelling slash selling to us on these platforms. We have already. We all know it, right? Facebook's different than it was five years ago because of it. And so then we go on to the next thing. This is one big game of cops and robbers. And all I'm ever trying to do is be forward enough to break it down as quickly as possible because speed is what matters now. Figuring out as quickly as possible and more importantly executing as quickly as possible matters because you have to get value while it's current. I built Wine Library success on email marketing. I was email marketing in 1997. 80% open rates, 60% click throughs, real numbers and then slowly but surely everybody did email marketing. And that, then I did a wine show on YouTube, you might remember, when nobody was doing it. Less competition, more views, 07 on Twitter, more followers than I deserved, built a bigger base. So it's that same theme. This book is written to tell people what to do right now. I can't guarantee you what's gonna happen in three or four years. All right, let me push back a little bit. This, this audience is obviously self-selected. These are your fans. So yes, of course they, the, and family. The up, family here, too. Uh, uh, a phalanx of assistance as well. Um, but uh, you know, you, you put you, you you make it sound as though we're going into a brave new world. But I, I would argue that that a lot of what you say supports very old and classic techniques. There's real writing in this book. E- each one of these these things is brilliantly described. The insights are, are there. The 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 prose is is elegant. And even when I'm sitting here talking to you and meeting you. You're able to look in my eye and have a conversation for a half an hour without, uh, you know, fidgeting or, or dazing off. And I'm not just mean here on stage. I mean when we're alone together. I, I want to know how important is it? Yeah, when we're, when we're lovingly looking at one another's eyes. How, how important is it to to uh, to be able to speak a language that the self-selected um, 
Gary fans would also understand. Massively. You know, I mean, this is, this is all of them. These are all my fans, which is a small <laughs> percentage of the overall world. Listen, here's how I look at it. I look at social network content, what I call micro content, as a gateway drug to the ability to have a longer conversation. So many people here have relationships right now off the fact that there was context built on some of these platforms and it led to a bigger relationship. That's what I want businesses to have. You're gonna put out a cool little infographic on Pinterest which became a value proposition to a user which gave them a reason to start paying attention to you and go more all in on you. And so, you know, I'm not worried about the ADD culture because you know, the reality is, is we've been evolving for a long time. I mean, we used to lay on the field, look up in the sky and look at smoke signals to get our stories. I mean, that was real. We used to carve in caves and we used to do plenty of other things. Everybody said cable television was gonna ruin the world and who needs 30 channels? You know, 13 was plenty. I mean, these are, you know, I mean, these are real conversations. Blogs were a waste of time. We have print. Everybody's always, it's hip hop music. I mean, go read everything that was talked about about hip hop in 85, 86, 87, 88, and now look about the way it's talked about. When I started Wine Library TV in 2006, the wine world hated me. They thought it was stupid, I was making fun of wine. This YouTube thing is a fad, all that stuff. So this is the same game over and over. This isn't replacing anything. This is just the point of making that contextual relationship now as a gateway to something longer. Right. So one of the one of the examples I really like in the in the book is actually a, a, a low tech company, and they don't do a great job of it. But you've told me it's it's one of your favorite products. It's the Luke's Lobster. Um, and they don't do a great job of getting their logo out there. So why don't you give us some, some tips? I bet a lot of people out here are entrepreneurs and people who, who just need your plain advice. Give us some, some quick hit tips on what that one in particular should have done better. So Luke's Lobster's example in this, and you know, it was tough to make fun of Luke's because Lizzie and I once ate Luke's like four days in a row <laughs> when we fell in love with it. Um, it was a picture of Luke's Lobster's, but there was also the number one thing in the picture were the Cape Cod chips and the soda, and if you look at it quickly, you have no shot of knowing that this comes from Luke's. And so my point to them was, listen, if you're gonna use this photo, at least put a big logo in the bottom left. Two, I've really reconsidered the photo outright because you're giving more attention to other brands in this than you are yourself. The copy wasn't very clear. To me, there was just a much more attractive one picture of a gorgeous lobster roll, or many other places they could have went with it, but ultimately that picture looks like a lot of pictures that I see out there, which is people are not treating these platforms as, if every single person here left and said, every photo, for my business, I'm not talking about your normal life, from a business standpoint, every photo that I put out on Instagram and Facebook, I need to treat as if this was a full page ad in Vogue or Sports Illustrated or anything of that nature, that we would see far better work, and that's what I was pushing for there. Yeah, and I think even in one's personal life, it goes like that. You, we all have uh, Facebook friends or whatever who do 30 pictures of their newborn when two will do, or, or, <laughs> or, or we're constantly posting blurry vacation photos. And, and yeah, the, or our skanky Halloween costume pictures. You know, I mean, we're all doing it. Actually, those ones are welcome to friend me if they... If they <laughs> um, so can we, uh, can, you, can you walk us through, can you give us an example of a, a really... Uh, effective, inexpensive social media launch that you've seen uh, other than, than, say, Wine Library or other places? So, you know, my biggest problem with this question is here's the truth. I spend, th this was a very tough time for me. It's why there's so many great names of VaynerMedia employees in the front of the book who helped me gather the information. Mm -hmm. I'm very flawed in my knowledge of those kind of questions. Because I have 80 clients of my own, because I have my own brand and my own business, I really don't spend a whole lot of time paying attention to what's going on in the marketplace. And by the way, I'm not saying this because I think I'm cool, and I think it's actually quite inappropriate considering what I do for a living, but I want to give true answers. And the truth is, for me to sit here and muster up a successful campaign is a very big struggle because I just don't know. Because the truth is, the only ROI I actually care about is does it sell the thing that person wants to sell? Does it help pencils of promise, you know, get donations, for their organization? Does it help XYZ buy shoes and sneakers, come to an event? You know, I know what my dark posts promoting this event did and how it converted to RSVs, RSVPs and how people became aware of tonight's event. So the truth is, I'm not sure, but here's what I can tell you. I have been selling this book 
for several months. I'm sorry. I've been promoting and throwing a ton of right hooks since August. I sit here today doing a lot of social media work. I also sit here today by getting a lot of press, getting articles written in magazines and newspapers about the book, getting a three page profile in the New York Times, the cover of Inc. Um, all this, tomorrow night I'll be on Pierce Morgan, set your DVRs. <laughs> I've got all that going on and here's what I can tell you. Net net, on January 1st, I know exactly what the ROI is of all the social work I did and absolutely no damn clue on all the stuff that is in traditional media at all. I can do the media mix model to figure it out but I can't quantify it anywhere close to the fact that I can quantify in a digital world. By the way, I still massively believe in Pierce Morgan, I still massively believe in The Observer, I still massively believe in billboards and and radio and direct mail. The number one thing I'm arguing is as all of these people's attention starts going to other places, it is impossible for an outdoor billboard or a TV commercial or a radio ad to be as valuable as it was 10 years ago. And so I don't think this is the death of traditional. I think we need a correction. Newspaper full page ads for Wine Library at the Star Ledger are more expensive today than they were seven years ago. They're asking in theory Wine Library to subsidize to keep them in business and I don't think that's right for the end business and that's the conversation I want to have and more importantly, when things like Vine, Jerome, and things like Snapchat and things of that nature start emerging, I also know there's a high value of storytelling first because there is a land grab of opportunity within the first three or four years before the supply and demand curve of stories versus conversion happen.